this is the kind of approach that we're suggesting now, and which we're going to talk about all the way through this week, which is a healthy church, which implies both a vision and a process. So the first thing is, what is the vision of a healthy church? And then there's all the, all the process, little by little, of getting there, which will depend on lots of local factors. And I mentioned, I'll, I'll come back to this tomorrow, but we've got a year-round mentoring group that uh, Daniel and I have led for several years, um, in which we then go through this process, like in real time through a year. We, we, we haven't got time or the means to do it here. We, we're giving the big picture here, but we go through the process with the year-round mentoring. So think about that, and uh, during the, the, the week, we, we'll see how many of you would like to join us. Uh, there's already one person signed up here, and we hope there'll be more by, by the end of the week. So I'll come back to the vision and process, but just a couple of questions first. Um, the first is the need of revitalization. And this is what I discovered um, 15 years ago when I started looking into revitalization. These were figures which came from the United States in which they said that only 10 to 15% of churches were healthy and multiplying, 70 or 75% were plateauing or declining, and 10 to 15% were at or near risk of disappearing. Now, this, was, um, this study was done originally by the Southern Baptists in the United States, but I saw on all sorts of websites that many of the other denominations said it's the same. Uh, the American Free Church, for example, uh, the Assemblies of God, uh, all said the same thing. And sometimes we, we have this impression, you see these big, big churches, these flourishing churches in the States. But in a lot of their middle-sized uh, their, their cities, towns, small towns in the Midwest, the churches are struggling uh, like they are in, in Europe. So that, that was the situation in the States. So uh, I said, well, what's happening in France? Is this the same situation? So... Um, I contacted the leaders of the 22 denominations affiliated to what we call the CNEF, which is the National Council of French Evangelicals, uh, which, which covers the whole range of evangelicals in France. And um, I, I asked the, these leaders very subjectively, um, where would you put the churches uh, in your denomination in these three categories? I made, I made no claim to, to think this was a, a properly organized survey, uh, scientifically done. But it gave some idea. Uh, so all the leaders of these denominations uh, gave me the percentages that they, they thought um, applied to their particular denomination, which came out to this. Healthy or multiplying, about 51%. Uh, plateaued or declining, 38%. And uh, at or near risk of disappearing, 11%. So 11 and 38 is 49. <laughs> so it's really, as we say, 50 50. It's half the churches, even in France, where we've done so much church planting uh, over the last decades, uh, still needed revitalization. Um, just to put this into context, uh, some of you may know this already. France has seen tremendous growth in the spread of the gospel in the last few decades. In 1950, there were only about 50,000 evangelicals in France. And we think today about 750,000. And that's so between 1950 today and 75 years, a tremendous growth. Nothing very spectacular, just evangelism, church planting, church growth. And, and yet, some of those churches today need revitalization. So the National Council of Evangelicals now see this like the, the two wings of a plane, church planting, church revitalization. Both are necessary. Both are necessary. We need to go on planting more. Our aim in the CNEF, the National Council of Evangelicals, is one for 10,000. We, we want one evangelical church for 10,000, every 10,000 people in the, in the population. So we still have some way to go. Where I'm church planting at the moment in the, the borough, which is really quite near to central Paris, there are about 65,000 people. We, we started planting a church two and a half years ago. There, there had never been an evangelical church in that place, ever. And there was a Protestant church until 1918, 
when a bomb fell on the church, it was never rebuilt. <laughs> so for over a century, there was no gospel witness in this place, which is absolutely, well, I can walk to the Elysee Palace where the, the president lives in about half an hour. So right near the center of Paris, no gospel witness. And yet, we've seen tremendous growth. And that, that, is, that is great. So anyway, that is why we need revitalization. And I have this picture uh, on, in my office. It's an animal called the Tasmanian tiger. It became extinct in 1936. This was the last ever specimen, which is kept in a zoo in Hobart in Tasmania. And I put this in front of me on my desk saying, we must not allow this to happen to our churches. <laughs> We don't want them to become extinct and disappear. So we, we must work. People have worked over the years, sometimes to buy buildings, to build this church. We need, we need new life. We need to, to revitalize. A few signs of this decay. I, I, I don't want to stress this too much because I want to be more positive on what we can do. But it is important to understand what some of the um, issues might be. One is that Christians no longer dare to invite people uh, from outside. They're, they say, people will find that my church boring, irrelevant. Uh, uh, it's not even worth trying to invite them. If they come, they won't like it. Secondly, uh, of course, numerical decrease and the increase of the average age in, in of the people in the church. Uh, this can be a slow decline. You don't necessarily realize straight away, but someone going away for 10 years and coming back would see. Um, thirdly, uh, the structure and activities become more important than life in Christ. In other words, routine is set in. Um, we have this English expression, going through the motions. I'm not sure that you, you would understand that. You, you're doing it week after week because you have to have a service, so you do it, and you, you go through the motions. In other words, no creativity. No creativity. Um, a fourth thing is, in some churches, family dynasties. Um, the families that set up the church will prefer just to focus on maintaining what they put into place rather than accepting that things should change. And in some cases, uh, almost, I don't mind if the church dies with me <laughs> as long as we don't change anything. And family dynasties can sometimes be a, um, a, a real obstacle. Um, <coughs> Then you have this culture of taboos and resistance to change. Um, as we live in the uh, people living in the past, uh, it's like a museum church. Uh, it's um, a kind of nostalgia. It was great in the past. Um, uh, it's, uh, I remember being in one country in the, um, in the Baltic States, and uh, I was told that Soon after the fall of communism, people they would go out with a guitar in the streets and say, follow me to the meeting, we're going to have an evangelistic meeting. And the people just sort of played the guitar and everyone went to the, the meeting place. And uh, I met one or two older people who said, we don't have any success anymore because we don't do this. And the pastor said, well, I could go in the street and play the guitar as much as I want, but no one's going to follow me <laughs> in today's world to the meeting. Things have changed. And we have to accept that things change. But finally, and I think this is the maybe the, the biggest problem behind all this, that the Great Commission, the gospel itself even, can be forgotten. Um, I have been, and I, I admit it, I have been to churches of my denomination in France, once or twice, where in the whole worship service, Jesus was not mentioned once. And I'm not even in my denomination. You listen sometimes to the songs that are being sung, what it says. And you'll find that the gospel and Jesus is not being mentioned as such. Um, it's surprising. Or we don't even read the scriptures sometimes in the services because it's all well, praise music. The praise music can be good. That's, that's not my, my question. But it's a question of are we keeping the gospel central in our churches today? So... Those are just a, a few signs of decline. And so why do we need revitalization? For two reasons. The first is just numerical decline, which we mentioned, stagnation, if you like, but also, which is very con um, 
closely linked to this, we are not connecting with non-Christians when we preach the gospel. And this is particular, particularly the case in those societies which are becoming more and more secular. Uh, we're not connecting with people in secular society. So I want to go through those two things uh, rapidly. Um, the first numerical decline. This is the common pattern in a lot of churches. You, you start with growth, a new church is planted, new people come, a lot of enthusiasm, and after a while, this will tend to plateau. And one of the reasons is that as the church grows and develops, it becomes more and more inward looking. In other words, it's providing services for the people who are present. There'd be for the children, for the young people, the women, the men, whatever you want. Um, and so all the emphasis is on the growth, hopefully, of the Christians, and much less on how do we reach out to the people outside the church. So it's providing like a, um, a it's like a consumer church, which is intended for the, the, the consumption of the Christians. And so th there's, there are no new people coming into the church unless they come um, from transfer or new people arriving, new families arriving, but not through evangelism. So the church can, can begin to decline. And it's at that point where uh, sometimes people start saying, hey, what, what's happening? Although often they don't react until they're even further down, um, going towards the, um, the, the bottom, which is death, <laughs> the disappearance of the church. So that is, that is quite a, a common phenomenon, which, which you, can, you can see in, in, in life in all sorts of areas. For example, um, in a company. A company is making a good product which is selling. They rest on their laurels. They keep on making the same thing. Um, I was thinking this the other day. Um, 20 years ago, with a computer, you always had a mouse. Now, what happened to the factories that made these mice? If you can put it in the plural. <laughs> I don't know. They had, to, they had to produce something else. Otherwise, they, they, would, they would stop producing. And so if they don't adapt to the new society, the same thing will happen with a company. Same thing can happen in lots of areas of life, and so it can happen in, in churches. But the other reason, I said, is that we're not connecting with non-Christians when we preach the gospel. And I think this is a, a very important element. I've become all things to all men, so that all, by all possible means, I might save some. And I'm going to come back to that on Wednesday, uh, when I'm going to give a talk on contextualization. So I'm, I'm not going to talk any more about that just now. And I want to come to that. This is a diagram, or if I want to be modern, I call it an infographic, uh, of what a healthy church is. You, you, we, we can send you this, uh, uh, this or, or you can also, you can get this as well. We've got a um, a network website, um, which has got a name which is very easy to remember because it's just revitalization.fr for France, but it's bilingual. <laughs> you can click on the right flag and you'll get it in English or French. So you can find this and a lot of other stuff on our, our network website, revitalization with an S, because we're in Europe, uh, revitalization.fr. So th this is the vision that I was talking about of a healthy church. This is what we want to work towards. This is what our network has kind of produced little by little um, over the years. And it's, it's very simple. It's so simple that, in fact, um, I define a healthy church with only three points, which you've got in the, the blue strip across there. Centered on the gospel or centered on Jesus. That is the absolute central thing. Um, when that is central, people are not going to be self-centered. Um, they're not. They're, they're going to want to reach out to others with the gospel, centered on the gospel, both for evangelism and for the Christian life. Secondly, a healthy church is a place where Christians learn to love God and to love others. I hope all these things um, no one can really um, contest. Um, 
Paul makes it very clear in 1 Corinthians 15 that there is no other gospel. And in Galatians, this is absolutely central. Uh, Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his burial, risen again the third day, each time according to the scriptures. And learning to love God and to love others, that's Jesus who <laughs> said that was the, the most important commandment. So again, we can't disagree with that. The third thing, um, people don't always see, but this has to be within its cultural context. Um, you, you see this in the New Testament as the church moves away from Jerusalem and, and moves towards um, uh, the Greek Roman speaking worlds. Uh, an example, in 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 8, 9, and 10, there's a lot of development about food offered to idols. Well, honestly, in Jerusalem, they didn't need that. <laughs> There was no food offered to idols in Jerusalem. It just, just didn't happen. But as soon as the apostles and the missionaries met people from outside, this, they had to define this, like in 1 Corinthians 7, about marriage. What is marriage? The Jews and the, and the Christian, early Christians had the same view. There was, there was no, no problem. But as soon as they left Jerusalem, they had to uh, look into that. For example, uh, I've spoken to people from Asia uh, where... Uh, they have a lot of ancestor worship. And so the pastors must teach how do you deal with ancestor worship as a Christian? How do you keep in, uh, do you do it? What happens to the, your relationship with the, the rest of your family and so on? Well, I personally in Paris have never taught on that. I didn't need to. But we have lots of other issues that we have to be talking about. Um, the issues that people are talking about, uh, uh, Ecology, LGBT, uh, in France at the moment, a lot of discussion on the beginning and end of life. Our government recently put um, abortion into the, a, a right in the Constitution as a reaction to what was happening in the States. There's actually a constitutional right now to have abortion. And there's a lot of discussion at the moment in France about a new law for euthanasia. They won't use the word. Um, they talk about an active help in dying. <laughs> And the Christians say, well, we want an active help in living. <laughs> so we're going to try to <laughs> say the opposite. So these are issues that we have to talk about and we have to deal with in our context. So that is very simply um, a healthy church. And how are we going to live it out? Um, firstly, um, by bringing back into focus um, an idea, a theological idea, which has always existed and which has become very important in the last 20, 20 years. That is, the gathered church and the scattered church. Now, the gathered church is when Christians are together. Even when they're on Zoom, it's the gathered church, because the Christians are together, if you like. The scattered church is all the, the rest of life. So if a Christian is very committed, I don't think that any Christian will spend more than 3% of their life with other Christians in church activities if you just calculate the number of hours in the week. So the other 97%, they're, they're in the scattered church. And in this scattered church, um, uh, the emphasis is on the personal initiatives of Christians to build relationships with their family, um, their colleagues at work or at school, university, in their local community and with friends and other people they meet in their leisure activities. They want to do good to them and to preach the gospel as they get the opportunity. And the reason we gather together is to train ourselves um, and motivate ourselves for that. Um, you know, the only, the only verse in the New Testament, I think, that tells us that we must meet together. You know where it is, hopefully? Hebrews 10, yeah. Do not neglect meeting together as some are. And the reason given is to encourage each other to love and good works. That is, among Christians and to other people. That's why we meet together, to be encouraged and to know how to do good and to share the gospel with the people in these different relationships. So that is a, a very simple concept. And I've found when we started a few years ago, we used to say to church, well, first of all, work out your vision. But I found it didn't work because churches didn't have enough um, 
I can say they, they couldn't stand back sufficiently to say, well, what, what should our vision be? Whereas now I prefer to say, uh, give this as a vision and then work out locally how you're going to do it. It seems a, a better way of, of, of going about it in, in today's world. So if I take the, the, the healthy church again, um, a healthy church, therefore, is a group of redeemed Christians who are learning to love God, to love people in their cultural context. So in other words, loving God is the spiritual dimension of revitalization. Loving people is the social dimension, and in their cultural context is the societal dimension, or contextual dimension. And that's what we're going to be working on this week. Tomorrow, the emphasis will be on the spiritual dimension. On Tuesday, the emphasis will be on the social dimension. And then on Wednesday, the emphasis will be on the societal dimension. So we just sort of open up horizons, as we say, sort of to see a little bit more what, what this might imply, knowing that when we've understood it, after this vision, the process will take some time to get there. And the way I prefer to do it, my big question in revitalization is the same to the church, how can we do better? It's not a question of criticizing, saying we did it badly in the past or anything else. The past, obviously, some, some things were done because that was the context of the moment. But we're in today's world, how can we do better? That's, that's the question to ask. So, um, I was going to mention this. Um, you've already had this twice today. <laughs> On the film at the beginning of the day, and then um, with Renee as well. But these seven churches in the book of Revelation, this is the textbook, in one sense, of revitalization in the New Testament, because five of them are told to repent. And the word repent in the Bible means to change your mind, to think in a different way. Um, Ephesus, um, the loss of their first love. You have lost your first love. Pergamum, the need to fight against doctrinal error. Uh, Thyatira, the need to fight against sin and immorality. Uh, Sardis, the church, has a reputation of being alive. Best music group in the city. <laughs> but it's dead. <laughs> or Laodicea, the church is lukewarm. So I think if we take um, seven meaning completeness, as Rene said, in one sense this covers all the churches in all the continents over the last 20 centuries. All the, some have done very well, like Smyrna and Philadelphia, five needed to look into things, take a look at themselves and say, we need to act in these different areas. So uh, if there are five different churches, there are at least five different issues. So the process I'm mentioning will, will, will go in a different direction be, be, because of these different issues. So the process. Firstly, the spiritual aspects, as I said, meeting together to encourage each other through love and good works, which can happen in Two different ways. Firstly, through worship and teaching. That is, this will motivate us to love God. As we worship him, we get good teaching from the scriptures. The other thing is through instruction on how to be good witnesses in today's world. This is a little bit of a radical um, suggestion. But I started doing this a few years ago in my churches, my previous one in Paris and the one I am now. When we meet together on a Sunday as a church, we do three things. Not just worship, not just Bible teaching, but teaching about today's world. So every service we have teaching about today's world. Some of it is like in issues, what is um, secularism, what is postmodernity, what is wokeism. Issues such as I mentioned, LGBT, ecology, violence, racism, and so on, but all sorts of other things. The world we're living in, what's happening in other countries? Where is there persecution? Where is the Lord blessing? Or it could be, uh, how do we manage our money, or our time, or our screen time? Um, or it could be uh, science and faith. 
um, and things like that. It, it, all sorts of things to live in today's world. Uh, just to give you an example, um, next Sunday in my church in Paris, we'll have a time of worship. My colleague's going to preach, I know it's on Romans 7, we got that far. And I'm going to give teaching on the European elections as part of our service. This doesn't mean I'm going to tell people who to, <laughs> who to vote for. I haven't got the right. In fact, in France, I could go to prison for that because a pastor must not say his political opinion in, in the course of a, a church activity. But I want to explain the origins of the European Union, its Christian Democrat origins. I want to explain what it is. What are some of the issues on which you might decide to vote for different parties? This is so important. Um, in fact, uh, in, in France, a survey was done by the National Council of Evangelicals about Christians at work. And the figure that really got me was this. 85% of the people said, when colleagues at work bring up issues today, I don't know what to say as a Christian. So we try to teach that in, when we are together. It's the only time we're together. So bear that in mind. We may come back to that. The social aspect, that is improving relationships within the church and with unbelievers. So the gathered church, we can learn to love our fellow believers. Um, sometimes that's also a challenge. <laughs> they can be quite different <laughs> to us. But it's also um, learning to love others and share the gospel uh, in our relational networks. It can mean showing interest in them, listening to them, good, doing good to them, encouraging them. Um, you know, you, you say to a, um, a colleague at work, um, I heard your, your child is ill. Um, is that so? Uh, um, my wife and I will, 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 pray, will pray for you. And a couple of days later, say, how is your child? And so on. No one's ever refused it when I said, I'll pray for them, in, even in a secular country. So you're showing an interest in people. So this is the, the, the social aspect, which is so important today. Um, we did a, a, our evangelism commission did a, a, a professional survey. We asked a professional survey company to say, how would you like to learn about another religion? Uh, we, we couldn't ask the question, how would you like to be evangelized? <laughs> it wasn't the sort of thing a professional survey company would do. But they, they, they did a very, very good survey for us. And um, so how would you like to learn about this? Well, internet was the number one thing, obviously. The second thing was talk about this uh, with a believer over a coffee. 23%, even in secular France, that is a quarter of the population said they would do that, which means you have to build a relationship with the person and go for a coffee or, or something. But this, this relational aspect is the only way that we have in very secular societies really to bring the gospel. The only contact that people have with the gospel are the Christians that they meet. And so this is the importance of, of hospitality. Um, we did a th another survey, um, which was among people recently converted from a totally non-evangelical um, background. Um, it was 89 people. And we said, what, what were the um, factors that brought you to faith? And out of the 89, 55 said a relationship with a Christian in their circle of friends and acquaintances. And I think actually reading through it, um, some of the other answers were more or less saying the same thing. A colleague, a neighbor, um, one person talked about a nurse who came in to, um, every day to, to, to look after his wife and so on, and she was a Christian. So, um, and even factor two, feeling welcomed and accepted, building relationship with people. This is so, so, so important. Um, uh, just before I move on to the next one, um, I like very much in, in Luke, uh, in two verses in Luke, he uses the same expression, the Son of Man came. In the first one he says, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And the second one says, the Son of Man came seeking to seek and save those who were lost. All right, Luke <laughs> summarized that well. The first was the Son of Man came eating and drinking, hospitality. So important, so important. 
either invite someone to your home uh, for a meal, if that's too much. Often we invite in, in France for a coffee or for the aperitif, as we call it, the apéro, uh, at the end of the afternoon. Um, and th that's the way we build a, a relationship with someone or go for a coffee. Uh, um, I've been to some countries in the Balkans where I think every other shop was a coffee shop, <laughs> it seemed to me. Um, that, so yeah, hospitality, just spending time with people, getting to know them, letting them see you, letting them see your, your, your couple, letting them see your, your family and, and so on. And then the societal aspect, um, understanding today's society in order to help Christians, which I said that I, I taught, um, facing today's challenges. We, we need to understand today's society for two reasons. Firstly, to protect the Christians, so that they understand more the dangers of different ideologies and so on today, but also to better reach out to the unbelievers. And what is interesting with this is that through understanding this, through relationships, we're actually very, very relevant. Because how do people make decisions today in a world of fake news and distrust and so on? They go on the internet. I know my wife does this. She wants to buy a product or something on the internet. She's not going to look and see what the manufacturer says or what the shop says. She's going to look at what other users say. That's the way it works today. What do the other users say? We are the users of Christianity. <laughs> we are the recommenders. So by building a relationship of trust with people, I think that is the way in which the gospel will spread in today's world. So just three implications of this model for leadership. The first is we have to avoid this default position to which years of church tradition can bring us. The important, the important thing in the church is the faithfulness of Christians in attending meetings. You measure the zeal of the Christian by the amount in which they attend the meetings of the church. Whereas in this model of the scattered church, uh, to what extent are the Christians being faithfully, visibly salt and light and Christian in society in, in, with all the people they meet. The second is the belief that the local church is the only place in which believers can learn and have a ministry. So we're saying for most people, their ministry will be with the people that they meet all through the week. And they might have different ministries. Some may have a ministry of apologetics. Some may have a ministry of, of, of service. Uh, some, not everyone will, will do it in the same way, but all the Christians are in the missional church, are missionaries sent out to love people and to exercise their ministry. Um, just a little anecdote, a few years ago in my church in Paris, uh, a brother was leading the service and we didn't see how he did this, but uh, I think he got one of his children to put a big notice on, on the door. And so, we all had our backs to the, the, the exit door. And at the end of the service, we turned around and there was this big poster that said, attention, you are now entering your mission field. <laughs> Just as we left the church, everyone is going out in their mission field and that we're meeting together to prepare each other for that. And the third thing is uh, the emphasis on the scattered church on initiatives by Christians, sometimes the pastoral team want more accountability. You can't know what all the Christians are doing. You can pray for them. Sometimes they can come and ask for help. Sometimes they will join a something like an IFES group at university. That's probably their best way of, of evangelizing. Um, it's not in competition to the church. The church can't do that. The church can't go on the campus, for example, or there may be other ministries like Jews for Jesus or, 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 or with down and outs or something, and different people might do different things. The important thing is to say, take initiatives. Ask God how, what you can do. Can you invite your neighbor for a meal, for example, or can you join a walking club or, or something? I wanted to join a walking club in my, my town. Their walks were on a Sunday morning, <laughs> unfortunately, so it wasn't possible to, to do that. But you can, you can do different things like that.